And so it gives me great pleasure and delight to invite to the podium Reverend Sean Friday. Moderator, members of the court, we're here in Cornerbrook, a place where the earth and the sky and the sea meet in one place together, and the wind, which is the very breath of God, has come to caress our cheeks and tossel our hair. And we are meeting here on Grenville campus, named after the intrepid Dr. Grenville, who over 100 years ago plied these very waters by schooner establishing medical and educational facilities up and down the bays and inlets of this coast and along the shore of the Labrador. Dr. Grenville had a deep and profound sense of compassion that guided his entire life. Not sympathy, not saying we are sorry, and not empathy saying I feel your pain, but that rare form of compassion that allowed him and others to enter into the suffering, the chaos, the trepidation, and even facing down certain death itself. He's less known for breaking the power of the fish mer merchants who controlled the economy and the government and all the resources of the province that kept people voiceless and destitute. And there are many words that people have ascribed to him. Tenacity, determination, persevering. But the one I like best is guts. He had good old-fashioned guts. And he also had a compass. And every school child here in Cornerbrook knows the value of a compass. It points the way to where you are going and keeps you from getting lost and off course. And every mariner knows that every few years you have to literally come and swing your compass around and around to recalibrate it so that you can arrive at your intended destination. Because if your compass is off a little bit over the short haul, that's no, not so bad. You can make a, a quick alteration in your course without much ado. But if your compass is off a little bit over the long haul, the results will be utterly disastrous. So here in Cornerbrook as church we gather to swing our spiritual, our moral, and our organizational compass this week to reset our bearings and to find new directions. The indigenous people of this land have spoken unequivocally through the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and it is painfully clear that we need to swing our compass and chart a brand new course based on the recommendations to the churches, not the ones that we might like to cherry pick, but all of them that we approved here. Particularly the recommendations concerning the establishing of permanent funds for reestablishing language and culture. We need to put our money where our mouth is. People say that the United Church of Canada is broke. The church is not broke. The general council might be broke, but the church is not broke. We sit on billions of dollars of assets, well beyond imagining at the time of union, that need to be reimagined and refashioned. The LGBT communities here and around the world that are subject to so much hatred and violence need to hear a full-voiced apology from the church and it needs to happen a lot sooner than later. We have been part of a culture that has included inculcating devastating forms of homophobia on our LGBTQ brothers and sisters, and our silence condemns us. We have come too far, we have worked too hard to fall mute now. And when we speak those words of apology and reconciliation, we will then be able to take our rightful place at the table of human equality. And then I invite us to swing our compass this week. 
In a world where 75% of the world's mining corporations operate out of this country and the Toronto Stock Exchange, and I have seen firsthand the impact of Canadian mining interests abroad, the devastation of the environment, the dislocation of Indigenous communities, the impunity of government forces, the viciousness of the militias, the trampling of rice fields, the political prisoners that as we speak and meet here this week languish in jails on trumped up charges, the murder of Indigenous leaders and lawyers and clergy and union representatives, the champions of the people, we really need to swing our compass and keep swinging our compass until a brand new course of action comes about in the way we invest in the world, from our congregational givings right through to our pension plan givings. We are not being asked this week to divest from every mining company. It gives me great pleasure and delight to invite to the podium Reverend Jordan Cantwell. A wise elder in our church taught me that when we know what we're about, decision-making becomes easier. We have big decisions before us and it won't be easy. But if we stay focused on what we're about, on our calling as a church, then some decisions get easier. When we remember that we're called to be a community that practices deep listening, mutual trust, and humility, that embodies Christ's compassion not just in the decisions that we make, but in how we make them. We'll be committed to listening to other voices, and especially those that disagree with us, knowing that there is wisdom there that we need to hear, and we will make more faithful decisions for it. Si nous nous souviendrions que notre raison d'être est de suivre l'Esprit Saint, sans fiant à Dieu nos guider et nos corriger sur la route, En savant notre décision sont leurs racines dans les principaux et les valeurs nous partageons. Peut-être nous pouvons laisser la tentation pour savoir comment tout va se terminer avant de prendre le premier pas. Taking the bold and courageous steps we need to take to be extravagant in our generosity, determined in our efforts for justice, and fearless in our openness to new ideas is easier when we know that all these decisions are grounded in faithfulness to the one who was fearless and extravagant and determined in his pursuit of God's realm and who calls us to follow his lead. This will require our best selves and deep trust in one another. And when we remember what we're truly about as a church, we are our best. And we will find we have trustworthy companions on this journey. We know that the life of the church is not measured by budget figures and statistics, but by its faithfulness to the gospel. And the reports and proposals coming before this court reveal a passionate commitment to the gospel values of justice, compassion, and reconciliation just a few examples. We have renewed calls for a national inquiry into murdered and missing Indigenous women, a commitment to reflect deeply on our relationship to the land and how that shapes us. Nous avons choisi fortifier notre relation œcuménique en témoignant de la possibilité de l'unité en travers les différences profondes. Nous nous engageons 
à l'exécution des recommandations de la CVR dans l'Église et dans la société. Nous avons des propositions lesquelles demandent la justice pour les enfants, les prisonniers et prisonnières, les peuples qui sont opprimés, la terre. Other proposals show concern for equity for rural communities, for new parents, youth, ministry personnel, United Church francophones, outreach ministries, the list goes on and on. Even the proposed amendments to the comprehensive review recommendations are rooted in concerns about justice and mutual accountability. The desire to ensure that we continue to be a community that is connected and that cares for one another. Folks, we ooze gospel. Nous sommes en vie avec l'esprit. That's why I'm convinced we must be here for at least another 90 years. But to do that, we need to make some changes. Always keeping the gospel at the heart of everything we do, including our efforts to streamline our structures and balance our budgets and set our priorities. It's all so that we are better able to embrace the abundant life to which Christ calls us because that is what we are about. L'Esprit Saint est entre nous. Nous donne la sagesse collective pendant que nous faisons ces choses. God is calling forth from our midst amazing young leaders with vision and courage who are already practicing new and exciting ways of being the church, leading the way, showing us what's possible. So friends, take heart. Even in the presence of very real hardships that many of our ministries are facing, knowing the reality that some jobs will end, some work will be let go. Without denying these truths and the grief and the loss that we're feeling, let us take heart. For there is much to give us hope. These next three years will be filled with excitement, challenge, sorrow, with both triumph and failure, endings and new beginnings. But let us choose that above all, they will be filled with hope. For it is hope that fuels our vision and gives us courage and allows us to follow joyfully wherever the Spirit may lead. May we be a hope-filled people who know what we're about and to whom we belong. Amen. It is my pleasure and delight to invite Reverend Karen Hilfman Milson to the podium. The summer I was seven, my older sister and I made up a game of choosing an imaginary family. Jan chose famous people, I chose people I knew, until she chose John Lennon. I immediately claimed Paul McCartney. Her response, I want all the Beatles. I thought for a moment, then I said, okay, you pick anyone you want to be in your family and I will take everyone else. You don't want people in prison. Yes, I do. You don't want people who live on the street. Yes, I do. The list continued, punctuated with my adamant, yes, I do. That game still impacts my life. I look at strangers and I think, you don't know it, but I chose you to be part of my family. I chose all of you to be part of my family. And the church gets that. 
Our crest declares that all may be one and all my relations. Relationship rooted in authentic connection is a key to transformation. In the work ahead of us as the church, it is critical that we develop things from a relational perspective as we restructure ourselves and develop new partnerships, as we deepen our capacity for radical hospitality in a multitude of different ways, as we explore the path of reconciliation to reconciliation with First Nations people, relationship is central. A significant focus of my ministry has been to develop circles within small groups and for meaningful conversations. Over the years, I have witnessed a new culture emerging as a result of circle gatherings. I describe it as circle culture. In our work on becoming an intercultural church, it is recommended we use circles to ensure that the wisdom of all voices are heard. In circles, we create an environment of trust where it is safe to be authentic and courageous. We listen deeply for the wisdom and creativity that is within us and amongst us so future possibilities may emerge. Love guides us rather than fear. Respect and encouragement thrive and we focus on what we can do. Circle culture is a place where the Christ spirit can crack us open and align us with the energy of love. Although circle culture is developed through spiritual and community practices, it is more than a system. It can be a way of life. I believe that it can be a way to mend the world. I have seen circle culture transform lives, circumstances, and congregations. I have worked with people around the globe and in the church who are passionate like me about the potential for transformation that's in the world. So, when I read the comprehensive review report, I was delighted by the commitment to renewal and transformation. It was while I was reading the opening section that an awareness emerged in my mind. It's going to take someone with very specific skills and passions to be the next moderator. They're going to need to inspire people to be led by vision and spirit, to encourage people to be open to new possibilities, and be willing to show up lots to listen deeply and share stories of hope. And then spirit spoke in a deep voice, edged with humor, and who has those skills and passions, Karen? Oh, over the past 30 years, people have told me I need to let my name stand for moderator someday. This time, Spirit spoke directly to me and said, the time is now. Colleagues, peers, and family agreed, yes, now. If we and the Spirit discern that I am to be moderator at this time, I will draw on the wisdom of angels and Jesus in moments of change. Be not afraid. Fear not. I am not afraid. I am hopeful and excited. There is a spiritual awakening that is happening around the world, and we get to be part of it. There are people everywhere who are committed to creating human lives that are environmentally sustainable, socially just, and spiritually fulfilling. Evidence abounds, including in our workbook, that spirit is at work in the world, guiding us toward the kingdom of God where the power that reigns is love. So, let's go for it. Let's make sure we listen deeply to spirit, which will challenge us, demand much of us, open us to joy and renewed life, and send us out to engage the world with the transformative power of love. We shall go out with hope of resurrection. We shall go out from strength to strength go on. We shall go out and tell our stories boldly, tales of a love that will not let us go. We'll sing our songs of wrongs that can't be righted. We'll dream of 
It gives me great pleasure and delight to invite Reverend Andrew Richardson to the podium. Friends, the joy of God be with you. In her novel, The Living, Annie Dillard describes a family standing at a graveside. And as you can imagine, they are distraught and angry and overcome with the weight of grief. And in the background, a reader gravely intones the scripture, O oh death, where is thy sting? And as the words fade into the air, one character thinks out loud, just about everywhere since you ask. And it is. Death stings just about everywhere. And we've all here experienced some personal loss and grief, and it's exhausting, and it's spiritually draining. Death is just about everywhere. Another shooting, another bombing, another war, another accident, another environmental disaster, another injustice. We hear the stories, we watch the videos, and it is numbing. Death is just about everywhere. And we know death in the churches too. Churches close, buildings are sold, old familiar hymns and liturgies and structures are buried deep. Fewer people, aging congregations, shrinking Sunday schools, deathly demographics. Friends, the news is not good. And it's no wonder that one of my colleagues asked me, why would you want to lead a dying church? And there is so much death, it becomes easy to believe that that is all there is. And even in the church, yes, even in the church, we often live as if the center of our faith is Lent, dark and penitential and joyless. Or Good Friday, death and despair and defeat. And like Hazel Motes in Flannery O'Connor's Wise Blood, many of us shout to the world in our deeds and in our actions, I'm a member and preacher of that church where the blind don't see and the lame don't walk and what's dead stays that way. Well, friends, herein is our dilemma. The malaise of our church and the mainline churches is not so much structural or financial, it is theological. In the midst of death, do we believe in life? The contemporary prophet Wendell Berry challenges us to practice resurrection. Well, this is the original mission statement of the church, practice resurrection. Not just believe it, not just preach it, but practice it, live it. And we are called every single day to be reminders to a crucified world that death in all of its forms is not the final word. We are called surely to be heralds of God's incredible hope, which even now is bursting forth. Clarence Jordan reminds us that the proof that God raised Jesus from the dead is not the empty tomb, but the full hearts of his transformed disciples. The crowning evidence that he lives is not a vacant grave, but a spirit-filled fellowship. Not a rolled away stone, but a carried away church. Surely the Gospels teach us that resurrection is a verb, not a noun. And so the story of the resurrection is that creation is wired for new beginnings. And when death and the losses of life have us feeling lost and afraid, hopeless and helpless. Resurrection reminds us that life is intimately and endlessly intertwined with death. 
and the old must be torn down for the new to be raised. To have a resurrection, you must have a crucifixion. And yet, in every ending is another beginning. Resurrection is the exorcism of our crippling unbelief, which renders us dead in life rather than alive in our dying. My friends, as a candidate for moderator, I offer you no certainty, no bag of magic tricks to save the church, not even a structure that can pass in this group without amendment. <laughs> I can assure you that there are losses ahead. There is much grief to deal with. But what I do offer is a deep abiding belief in the sure and certain hope of resurrection. And that right now, I am certain that here at this council, in our faith communities, in our lives, in all corners of creation, in the church and outside the church, resurrection is happening. And as moderator, I would hope only to be a curator of our Easter stories, to be a catalyst Three things I promise, holy God, in age and youth, in life and death, to bless your name and cling to Christ, and listen for the Spirit's breath. I follow, serve, and cling to Christ amid our cultures, tides, and trends, for here our name is most revealed, majestic love and best of friends. And once again, it delights me to say we have such leadership in our church. And once again, we have heard from four of our nominees and we celebrate. Remember, there are still four more to hear from and that will happen this evening. <laughs> 